Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the program. It's a Wednesday morning and that means you and I are together on Let's Talk, coming to you live from our Sunning Hill Studios right here in Johannesburg. You're watching ITV Networks. Welcome to the program. As always, great to be with you and do remember our lines are open. We're waiting to hear from you. Do become a part of the conversation. Coming up on the show, we're going to be talking endometriosis with Lynn Zurnama. She's from Oz Health Communications. We're also going to be looking at homeopathy with uh, Dr. Raisa Desai. But right now, we're going to talk about something real interesting and exciting. It seems to have become an annual event in our part of the world, and it is the marriage conference. If you call in with thoughts or comments, you might walk away with a couple of free tickets to attend this amazing event. And as always, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the program a colleague and a dear friend and he is Idris Kamisa. Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh. How are you? Alhamdulillah with your du'as. What's your energy levels like? Because this must be a logistical nightmare putting together the marriage conference. You know uh, Julie uh, many people ask me I mean, why would I travel in the month of Ramadan spend two or three days a week having sleepless nights making dua, meeting with the individuals, promoting the program, engaging with media partners, and thinking about it. Why? It's because, as you know, and as the community knows, that in terms of our community, there's lots of issues that we need to address. And not only that, it's not about only addressing issues. It's a fact that we can make the home a sanctuary, there is more cohesion with the family, and young people need to be acknowledged, and women want their spaces, as it were. We need to affirm them. And also we have people that got uh, vendors who want to sell their wares and show that. They, we've got bloggers that want their space. You want children who want their space. And why I'm saying all of these things, because this experience, inshallah, on the 22nd of July, 2017 at a convention center, Santon, is far different from the last year's one. It is not a lame replication of that. And that is exactly what I was going to ask you. And before I get to that, I, uh, you know, as you're speaking and unpacking what the new conference is all about, I'm sitting here thinking it is also an act of ibadah. It is the Mubarak month of Ramadan, and we all are wanting to do our little bit. And undoubtedly, uh, you and I were talking off air, and I asked the question, I asked about the logistics, I asked about costings. I have n no doubt in my mind something as glamorous and as professionally put together. If last year is anything to go by, it's going to be truly the place to be, uh, to meet and greet people and to come away having learned something. Uh, but I know that it runs into millions of rands. But at the same token, I also know it's for non-profit. No one gets enriched by this. It's something that we're giving back to our communities. And nothing drives you more than intrinsic motivation. Doing something, leaving a legacy. I mean, for example, last year, the feedback we got was positive, right? And we always want to improve. We're not, we don't wax lyrical and say, wow, wow, hey, great stuff. You know, I like it and massage our ego. <laughs> you know, for example, I mean, Sister Hella Banani, who was a speaker last year, is coming back. And she had a profound impact on our sisters especially. And one sister told her that, you know, today was going to be my last day in my marriage. I listened to your talk. It resonated with me. And I'm making a renewed commitment to my marriage. I mean, couldn't you put value on that? Another couple uh, who I know, uh, he said to me, I came there. But that program uplifted me, made us rethink the way we are handling situations. 
young people were meaningfully engaged, right? So the whole thing is this, that, you know, for me, as you rightly indicated, Julian, is so true. Uh, it is not, for me, it's an ibadah. For me, you know, it is in keeping with the first ayah, ikra. When many people ask me, Idris, what is happening to the ummah? I said the biggest issue that we forfeited the first ayah. Young people are not articulate enough to defend the faith. We as elders are no more in charge of our home. The man has become emasculated. We as a ummah are dysfunctional. And whether we like it or not, socially, economically, geopolitically also, we have issues. And it's a day of enjoyment, of having fun, of learning, engaging. We are gregarious people. And I know people might respond to what you just said about the problems in the community and as a ummah. And the question that pops into my mind, for example, is, so what is one day going to make a difference? At least the difference is that it's going to leave you thinking very profoundly about issues that were raised at the conference by the most dynamic of speakers. In fact, I want to say this. We are not calling this, well, this is an important thing, a marriage conference anymore. So the, there is this erroneous notion, well, if he has gone for it, then he's got issued his marriage. So he's far from it. Or I'm looking for a spouse. I'm, I'm looking, looking for, for a, a partner and I haven't been successful thus mm -hmm. far. So hopefully yeah. I'd be able to meet my Mr. or my Miss Wright at the conference. And that's not what it's about. And absolutely. For example, I just tell you this, right? We're calling this the Muslim lifestyle fest. Mashallah. Now listen very carefully. So I want the viewers to understand. Muslim lifestyle fest. It's going to be a festival. It's going to be about lifestyle and about a Muslim lifestyle. And the big component is going to be the marriage conference. In the marriage conference, you have the plenary sessions in the huge hall that accommodates about 4,000 people. You're going to have your workshops, adjoining workshops. Then you're going to have, inshallah, the Muslima event. It's a three, two and a half to three hour event. And I'm talking to the sisters, a magic program. Sisters also want to engage with each other, talk about issues that, that affect them. It's not about creating an adversarial relationship that sisters will come there, they'll feel macho now, they'll come home, they'll become a... No, it's far from, <laughs> it's far from it. Right. And sisters, you know, when they talk to each other, they are much more nurturing, they're much more engaging. And they are, be, besides the, the program, it, I, I was with the sisters yesterday, so dynamic, so beautiful. It, you'll feel good to be a woman, you know, you'll feel a sense of empowerment, you, you understand? So tell us, um, something else you mentioned off air which really surprised me was the price of the tickets. Now, but before the price, let me finish the whole component. Okay. You got the Muslim Eye event, right? Then you got, very, very importantly, you got a souk. In that souk, there is going to be exhibition, there's going to be a corner for the sisters, there'll be a blogger's corner, you know, and all of that's taking place, right? Then we're also going to have the soul seekers. Then we also got a youth center, a kiddies corner. And immediately after the marriage conference, we've got the ilam arts. Normally these two are never combined, but we are doing it for the first time in this country, where we're going to have young people, you're going to have uh, Nasheed artists from other parts of the world, one anyway, and you're going to have uh, uh, also a graphic artist, number one. Then what we're also doing, and we want to engage, we're going to have a talent search in this country, and inshallah, the winners will have an opportunity to go on the global stage. What we are doing, really, when you want people to engage, I'll give them the phone number in a moment. It'll be for uh, uh, Kira, there'll be for Nasheed and Spoken Word. We, we'll have three different categories, between the age of five and eight, eight to 11, I think, 13 to 18. So very, very different from last year's conference. Yes, so whilst the auditioning is going on, the individual best in each of the uh, categories, either a male or a female, representing. Now, that will be an opportunity for young people to understand because in the area, we do not give young people an opportunity. We tend to sermonize, lecture to them. We don't speak to them in that language of understanding. Now, you can see how comprehensive this is. Got, in other words, there are five events for one ticket. 
At what price? Can you believe this? Now, lucky you are sitting here, Julie. <laughs> lucky you are sitting here, you might collapse. It's 150 rands. For the 150 rand, you can go to the marriage, you go to the sukh and the ilamats. The next level is 300 rands. 300 rand gives you access to workshops, everything. The 500 rands, right? Then the 1500 rand, which is mostly for sponsors and everyone else. It is going to be vibrant. It's going to be exciting. And really, I'm going to be in the musalla because I know there are so many things. And we are meeting. We discuss issues every day. And you know what, Julie? The reality is today, young people want to be entertained. There are parents today who lift up their hands. What do we do for that day? So there is no excuse for anyone. You must attend. You have to attend. And I promise you this. I promise you, my beloved brothers and sisters, you're going to feel enriched. You're going to feel empowered. And what I want in the end, what all of us want. All right, we need to take an ad break. Uh, are we giving a couple of tickets away on the show today? I am such a, you know, <laughs> a, a generous person. Right. I don't mind giving 10 tickets away today. Well, there you go. Okay, I'm talking to Brother Idris Kamisa. He's talking about the upcoming event uh, towards the end of July. Just give us those dates again. 22nd July, starting, you've got to be there early for registration. The program will start, inshallah, punctually at 9 o'clock in the morning. Till what time do you expect the, to be the, running? The, the, the marriage program itself till 7. Immediately after that is the Ilam Arts. All right. Uh, so that's uh, 22nd of July, starting at 9 o'clock in the morning. When we come back from the ad break, Idris is going to tantalize us by giving us the names of all the amazing guests that are going to be at this conference. So do call in if you want to attend. Who knows? You might just walk away with a couple of tickets. He's committed to 10 giveaways. So get your fingers dialing. Let's uh, take an ad break, inshallah. It's a Wednesday morning, it's Let's Talk, and we are talking with Brother Idris Kamisa. We're talking about the Marriage Conference 2017. Do call in if you'd like a couple of tickets for the show, which is happening on the 22nd of July at the Santon Conference Centre. I would correct you. It's not a marriage conference anymore. Oh, as you've said. Muslim Lifestyle Fest. There you go, the Muslim the Lifestyle, lifestyle Fest. Fest. I stand corrected, the Muslim Lifestyle Fest. Get uh, to the telephone right now to claim your tickets to the Muslim Lifestyle Fest. Now, you want to share some numbers yes, with us. Yes. What are they about? Yeah. Now, these numbers, are when you, if you want, they want to buy tickets, they need to, and it's very important, they must start dialing. It's plus 27102-02160. I would repeat that, plus 27 one zero two zero two one six zero or plus two seven one hundred two zero two one six one. I think it's best if you give us a website address for yeah, people to take yeah, these numbers yeah, yeah, down. Yeah, the website is www.marriageconference.org.ca.za. Just give that to us once again. W W dot marriageconference.org.za All right, so just in case you're a bit confused, the numbers that Idris has given out is for um, purchasing of tickets to this event. Um, if you didn't manage to get that down, just go to their website address. But the number to call in here for the free giveaways, you can do right now. And you do know what that number is. Now, and also, also, if there are uh, volunteers who want to participate, the benefits are many in terms of tickets and for affiliates. Because we really need to spread this good news throughout South Africa. Let's talk about the volunteers. What exactly are you wanting? And it's, it's really a wonderful opportunity for young people to interact, widen their networks, and also in the process gain some sort of life experience. In fact, Julie, I shared with the volunteers last week 10 benefits in being a volunteer. It enhances your self-esteem. You become a person that is confident. It helps you in terms of finding work. It makes you feel good that you are able to connect 
with empathy of people around you. It affirms you as an individual. It, you develop your emotional, your EQ. So it's unbelievable. So obviously the volunteers are not going to be required to be there on the day only. There's going to be a build up. There's going to be lots of briefing sessions, etc. So just outline that for us so people can then make themselves available. Right. Now the, we're going to have several meetings and the, they, are, they have two objectives. The one objective is, of course, selling some tickets. Right. It is five, six, whatever you can sell. Right. And, and on that day, they'll be stationed at different places. And Alhamdulillah, we can attribute much of our success to the commitment of these volunteers. Then you have affiliates. Alhamdulillah, many of our sisters are affiliates in different parts. They are vibrant. They, you know, they through their blogging or whatever, they are also selling tickets. We need to sell these tickets. We need to promote it. And Alhamdulillah, we're going to make sure that any person that wants access to it, we're going to make sure we, we're, not, we're going to allow that access. We want it to impact to the wealthiest and the poorest of the poor. We want organizations to participate in it. And you know what? Only, you know they say in life, if you're not rowing the boat, then you can rock the boat, <laughs> right? It's only when you're involved, you know what you are doing, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't understand. So it's very easy to be a spectator and be a kind of, you know, and an armchair critic. Oh, yeah, correct. That's it. Armchairs, these armchairs are good, really. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Volunteers, um, if they want to participate, oh, oh, yeah. how do they get yeah. in touch with you? No, no, the same numbers. They must yes. phone those numbers. Or go to the website. Yeah, website, yeah. But rather, they phone those numbers up and give the names, uh, you know, and inshallah, we take it from there. Let's just understand how much of time will they have to give to this conference, just so for people who are studying or having to arrange their lives? You know, essentially, essentially, there may be only two more meetings before the marriage conference. Where do you meet? We will meet uh, in Johannesburg at our offices at Melrose, and in Pretoria, we'll meet them there, number one. The other very important thing is this, that they would require on a daily basis maybe 15, 20 minutes selling tickets. That's all, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's so, it's so easy to mm -hmm. do it because they'll also believe in this particular cause. There's not an issue. The one a great thing is, you know, we have these Muslim women's forums throughout the country and be wonderful to hook up with them you in know, all have, the different have, towns have, have, so they that. can sell the tickets. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. And now, one, more, one more thing. Uh, last year we had the Soul Seekers, right? Mm -hmm. And, I, and this year we're having it, we're only limiting it to 120 people. By the way, how many people did you hook up last year? Last year there were a lot of people connected, but nothing really happened. But at least they learned exactly what they should do, what kind of questions should they should ask. In Where fact, they're going wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, in fact, just for the information, uh, the, the one difference is this year, before the Soul Seekers program is mandatory for them to uh, be part of a program which I'll be conducting. It will be called How to Choose Your Spouse. And secondly, we're giving each one of them a gift of four CDs that I've done. It's called Pre-Marital Conversations. And we are also on that day giving them dates for subsequent Soul Seekers program. And it's a need, really. All right. Now, the exciting part, well, not that that is not in exciting and interesting, and I think that would really benefit young people going forward. Um, let's talk about the amazing personalities that are going to be at the event. Alhamdulillah. We're going to have Sheikh Yahya Ibrahim. And he was here last year he as well. He was here, and he did the love stories from the Quran. And I can tell you, it was such a beautiful, poignant, moving, inspirational, and how he made it relevant to our lives, whether you're a single father, whether you're a single mother, whether you've got issues with your children, whether it's the marital issues, moving stories, moving stories. Then you've got him. Then we've got uh, Sheikh Zahir Mahmood from the uh, UK, very popular with our radio uh, listeners in South Africa. We've got Sheikh, Yaya, uh, Sheikh Yawar Beg, who is like a household name, you know. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah. Then we've got, uh, for example, we've got Sheikh Dawood Butt we've got. We have also have, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, you know, uh, Erosol Ali, who is becoming Faisal Saleh, a very dynamic Nasheed uh, artist. And then the sisters, we've got Sister Lauren Booth, 
the, uh, uh, the activist. Yeah, activist. Mm -hmm. She's very vibrant. Yes. And I share a platform with all of these people, so I know them. You know, very vibrant. She's got a sense of humor. She is the sister in law of Tony Blair. That's right, yes. Right. Then we have Sister Zora Sarwari, who is an author of 15 books. Then, of course, our own Hela Banani. I call her own because she's so much part of us. And locally, we've got uh, uh, Zahira Bam, you know, of Zahira. Course. We've got our own Molana uh, Ibrahim Bam, we've got uh, Molana Rawat, we've got uh, Sadullah Khan, Sheikh Sadullah, Sheikh Fuzail, uh, Sufi, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yours truly, right? Of course. <laughs> uh, let's look at some of the, the, the topics they're going to be covering. Mm -hmm. We want to whet the appetites of our viewers. So what sort of things are they going to be dishing out on the day? They're discussing a whole... And then we also got uh, Molana Junaid Kasani and Farooq Hafiji where they're going to discuss adult issues in terms of intimacy. Now, the topics go from a whole range about parenting, about, uh, you know, uh, making choices. So it covers every aspect of your life at home. It's something for everyone. You understand? Now, you'll find that even with the Muslim event, uh, the, the discussing many of those issues. So the, uh, Which are very pertinent in this day and time because if young people have these type of problems, they really don't know where to go with them because it's so personal and also people are shy to yeah. bring these issues to the table. Absolutely, and I know Zahira Baum is doing a program, I think, about who am I, about uh, discovering yourself. You know, often what happens in relationships we are so focused on the other, want the other person to improve, but you forget that you need to discover yourself. I mean, uh, what is it that really makes you unhappy? And why does it make you unhappy? Stand by, we have a caller. Sister Zuleikha, assalamu alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam. I hope you're enjoying and the I'm, discussion. Gee, I am enjoying the discussion and I really appreciate it. Um, I would like to ask Brother Idris, um, is, is the talent competition for females as well? Ah, nice question. Y yes, yes it is. Alhamdulillah. Anything Tudakala. else you'd like to know? No, Tudakala. All right, and of course you do stand in line to win two tickets to the conference. We do hope we're going to see you there, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum to you. Wa alaikum salam. I interrupted you there. Do you want to expand on that? No, no, no. We are, we are, we are opening it to everyone. Mm -hmm. we, we're doing that because, you know, this is a point. And, and I'm saying this here with, and I understand sometimes some things can be sensitive. You know, I say to even a female, who are you? You'll tell me, Julie, I said, and ask you your name. Who are you? Yes, I'm a TV presenter. I didn't ask you what you do. Who are you? I'm a married woman. I said, and ask you whether you are married. Because you are the ummati of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the best answer I got, I am nothing but a humble servant of Allah. And I want people to understand that. Sometimes we allow these definitions to impact on who we are. It is not fortuitous. And to define, define us. Define us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is not fortuitous or by chance that Bibi Aisha is one of the biggest narrator and confirmer, uh, confirming hadith the lifestyle of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was a scholar in her own right. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying mm -hmm. to you? So we're giving everyone an opportunity. Of course, we're going to make sure that modesty prevails Absolutely. there. Absolutely. We're going to make all of those things we're going to do. And uh, because I know what is going on in our communities. Our houses are on fire. Absolutely. They're on fire. Really. And we need to be more engaging and also to nurture the talent. And there's so much of talent amongst our youth. You All know? right, we have about two minutes to wrap up time. The one uh, issue that I found last year was um, the non-availability of food in the actual conference center. And I do know that that was governed by the rules and regulations of the conference center itself. Are you addressing that? Because people had to go quite far mm. out to go and get some food, to buy food. In fact, that was an issue that we tried to negotiate uh, with the uh, authorities that be, powers that be. And we have had several meetings and we are making some headway. And just make dua, inshallah, we succeed, you know. And uh, I'm quite uh, optimistic uh, that is going to happen. All right, your closing thoughts. My closing thoughts, I say to you, my beloved brothers and sisters, you are going to have a fantastic time. I, I'm loath to use words like fantastic. <laughs> you know, you're going to have a great time. You feel enriched. 
And I remember a father, I met him at the, in the plane, and he said to me, you know, I did not come for it. My son said that he was transfixed. My young son who came there, he was so excited, so enriched. So I'm saying to all of you, it's an opportunity. It's a small investment that can change your life, can affirm you, can connect you to Allah and his beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I say it from my heart and I'm doing it because I love you. We are not here to make money. We are not here to manipulate you. We are not here to exploit people with and their caprices. And that's where we have to leave it, unfortunately. That was Brother Idris Kamisa. You can hear he speaks with deep, deep, deep passion about something which is really about the upliftment of our ummah, the ummah of the beloved Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and really great work. It was a great conference last year, and I have no doubt that this year is going to be even better. So make sure that you go online, book your tickets, and we're going to see you there, inshallah. And welcome back. Uh, it was wonderful talking to Idris Kamisa. He is so dynamic and he's here talking very passionately about the upcoming event on the 22nd of July at the Santon Convention Center. Now we still have a couple of tickets to give away. You can call throughout the show and qualify for the tickets to attend the conference on the 22nd of July. It is the marriage conference. Right now we're going to talk homeopathy. Now you're probably going to wonder homeopathy once again. Yes, but this time we're going to talk about a discipline within homeopathy which is different. The first time I've heard about it, so let's unpack that with the lovely Dr. Raisa Desai. Salaamu Alaikum, welcome. Wa Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Lovely to have you on the show and you are a doctor, you are a doctor of homeopathy. Tell yes. us a little bit about where you're practicing and then let's go, about, let's go into what you are offering that is different and exciting to the community. Jazakallah sure. khair for having me on your show today. So I am a homeopathic practitioner. I'm a registered homeopathic practitioner. I have studied in uh, Durban at the Durban University of Technology. Uh, the course that I have done was a five-year master's degree course and I graduated in 2014. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I now run my own practice and I specialize in functional medicine as well as biopuncture, herbal medicine, a little bit of Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine. So did you, was all of that covered whilst you were studying or were these additional courses that you went on? So the herbal medicine is part of the homeopathic degree. You touch on a little bit about that. You do a little bit of acupuncture as well, but I furthered my studies uh, through uh, integrative um, functional medicine course and I have done extra biopuncture and advanced biopuncture course which enables me to administer, uh, administer it and diagnose and treat according to the condition. Okay. I must say it's the first time I've heard about biopuncture and I'd yes. like us to go into detail with that in a minute or two but where are you practicing? So I'm based in Oakland, Johannesburg. It mm. is in a wellness center and uh, I've been practicing for about two years now alhamdulillah and I'm thoroughly uh, enjoying it. I'm thoroughly <laughs> passionate about it. I love what I do. Uh, I have a lot of success, alhamdulillah, um, in terms of my patients that I see. And uh, yes, I will tell you a little bit more about so, it. So, Raissa, if I come, well, number one, why should I come to a homeopath? What are you going to do differently uh, yes. for me to feel better and get control of my body and my mind? and possibly even my spirituality. What is it that you offer that is different to a medical doctor? Um, and number two, then we're going to go into, um, you know, all of the other alternatives. Yes. How will you decide which is the best fit for me? Okay. So the, the difference between conventional medicine and homeopathic medicine is that with conventional medicine, it is more a symptom-based approach where either the symptoms are eliminated, palliated, or it's suppressed. With homeopathy, on the other hand, it is a more safe and gentle approach in treating a person as a whole. So when a patient walks into my office, it's not just about assessing the symptoms that they present with. It is about getting to know what has caused 
that uh, certain condition, what are the modalities, so what makes it better, what makes it worse, um, are there any lifestyle factors that may have contributed to it, are there any environmental factors that are aggravating it, so you're getting an idea of the patient as a whole. In terms of prescription and prescribing homeopathic remedies, it is different to conventional, whereby it is not specific to a, a certain medication. There are many medications, for, for instance, for asthma. Five patients may present with, different, with the same symptoms, however, their modalities are different. So each base, patient might receive a different medication according to what best suits that patient. So in terms of that, it's very individualized, and that is what makes a homeopathic approach different to a um, conventional approach whereby you get into the under, underlying cause or the root of the problem. Now, when you talk homeopathy and you talk natural remedies as opposed to conventional medicine, um, we're living in the instant age and we want a quick fix. Yes. You go to a doctor, um, doctors are even saying these days that patients walk in and they demand to be injected yes. because they want to be better overnight. Is it similar with homeopathy? Or with herbal medication, does it take a longer time to heal? And how do patients then, yes. uh, you know, deal with the, the, the longer healing period yes. or the longer fixing yes. period? I think that's a question that I'm often asked, and there's a lot of misconception with that. So with homeopathic medicine, like any form of or any system of uh, therapeutic uh, treatment, it depends the, the 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 care and the treatment is proportionate to the chronicity of the, the ailment. So if you come to me with an acute condition, it can be treated almost instantaneously, depending whether it's infectious, whether it's an injury, if it's a common cold flu influenza. And yes, there are homeopathic influenza uh, injections, oh, injections, injections, yes, wow. immune boosters that mm -hmm. are given on site, uh, like immediate admi administration, as, along with the homeopathic medications, so uh, it can be treat uh, it can treat acute uh, conditions as well as your long term chronic conditions. So, in terms of the chronic conditions, obviously, if you've suffered for something for the past fourteen years, and you've been taking all forms of tre uh, treatments and conventional medication, whatever you have been taking, and you're now suffer suffering with it for the past 14 years, and now you see a homeopath. It might take up to six months, maybe, or give it a year. But if you look at the time that you've suffered with the illness compared to the, the, the time that you're spending at the homeopath in order to treat the underlying cause and hopefully, inshallah, have it read from your body, it doesn't seem that long. So of course, it makes, makes perfect yes. sense. I mean, for 14 years you've been suffering from the yes. condition. You can't expect an overnight, overnight fix. Too. What are the, more, um, the, the, the most common ailments that people come to you with and how do you treat them? And what sort of success rates are you having? So because I specialize in biopuncture, which is, it has been around for a while, but it's a new form of uh, injection therapy using sterile, low doses of homeopathic and herbal preparations. So unlike a homeopathic remedy that is given orally, these are ampules which are in a sterile form and are given to specific target regions in the body. So it can be used for musculoskeletal conditions like your arthritis, tendonitis, Achilles, um, for, your, uh, for your retinopathies, for, uh, for the, um, any, any type of inflammation. Um, sorry, Mavna, a, rep, a retinopathy, your tendinopathies. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be used for any musculoskeletal conditions, your sprains and injuries as well, as, lo as well as your inflammatory processes. So for your conditions like your sinusitis, allergic rhinitis, even if it's that's, anything that's gastric. A thing. Yes. That's a big thing, and people suffer endlessly yes. for years on end. How do you treat that and with how much of success? Alhamdulillah, the success rate is amazing. So in, with the conjunction of your homeopathic remedies, which I always love to use because that's treating it from the inside, I do a lot of biopuncture as well. So depending on whether there's a lot of blockage, 
post-nasal drip. So we might start off with a drainage. So you inject in the sinuses along the maxillary uh, line, the sinuses and the frontal uh, area, and that will help initially with the, the drainage of the mucus. After that, so, so these you're going injections, to feel worse before you get better. You might feel worse because obviously it's trying to get rid of all that, whether it's bacterial, whether it's mucus related, uh, it will get rid of that. And thereafter, we do injections that help with the inflammation. So to reduce the inflammation as well as repairing the sinuses in itself. So there's a lot of success rate, alhamdulillah, with that. And how long does that take? Because every yes. second person seems to be suffering from sinuses, yes. post-nasal drips, and they're pretty miserable with those consistent coughs as well. Sure. So treatment usually depends on the, on, the individual, on the individual and the severity of the condition. It can take from one session. Immediately from the first session, you might feel the, the difference and you might be okay after that. But in some conditions, it might take up to three or six treatments. And usually I like to do an interval of one week. So one injection per week. And uh, depending on that, the patient in itself will tell me, you know what, I don't feel like I need any more injections or I don't feel like I need any more for a while. And inshallah with that and the medication that I prescribe, the the condition just seems to, to de Disappear. Disappear. Yeah. All right, let's take an ad break. I'm talking to the lovely Dr. Raisa Desai. She's a homeopath based in Oakland's Johannesburg. And I must say that for the first time, uh, we're looking at different modality treatments as far as homeopathy is concerned. And I really like what she's saying. So if you have any questions or comments about any issues that you might be having, do call in the lines are open. Let's take an ad break. <laughs> Still to come on the show, we're going to be talking to Lynn Zurname. We're going to be talking endometriosis. But right now we're talking to a homeopath about homeopathy and all the other supportive treatments that she offers from her surgery in Oakland's Johannesburg. She is the lovely Dr. Raisa Desai. Raisa, back to you. We were talking uh, the treatment of asthma and possibly even um, sinuses and uh, mm -hmm. persistent coughs. Do you treat or do you refer on to a conventional doctor? And are there times that you feel that you're unable to do anything for a patient and, and then refer them on? Gee. So there are times where I do feel that, you know what, conventional medicine is necessary for the patient or other forms of treatment. However, I would always offer supportive therapy to that patient. So for instance, in a patient with uh, stage four cancer, I would, I would never discourage them to not to go uh, to, to avoid doing chemotherapy or any form of uh, palliative drugs, but I would offer them organ support. So through bioregulation, which helps to just get rid of the toxins in their body, to get rid of all the, the chemicals that are being put into the body and just to help sustain the immune system to fight any type of infections they, that they may be predisposed to and to just build a better res resilience to bacteria and viruses. So such. what is it? Do you give them some remedies to ingest? So I would give them remedies. I would do... Uh, probably immune boosters for them in, in, the, in the form of uh, injections as well as drops or tablets. And the conventional doctors are okay with that? I work a lot of, with a lot of GPs, alhamdulillah, mm. and it's a mutual understanding. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a place for both of it and I will not exclude one or the other. I think uh, it works well together. I think homeopathy can work well with conventional medication as well. And I find a lot of my patients as well who do uh, go the conventional route together with the homeopathic medicine. Eventually, get great results. they get great results. And at the same time, they also decrease in their dosage of both wow. to, to a point where they feel that they are stronger, not just, not just not just physically, but I think when disease affects your body, whether it's any condition, it causes stress. Oh. It causes a lot of emotional, mental fatigue Absolutely. on the body. So I think in terms of that, homeopathy is great because it addresses those, you know, those deep-seated issues that, you just that feel affect brand new. you feel better. And uh -huh. I think a lot of the times when you feel better, you have that positivity, you have that, 
you know, that energy to, yeah, to get through it absolutely. and you don't see yourself as a disease anymore. Mm -hmm. You see yourself as that person. Yes, I, like I do have a say. disease. <laughs> I do have a disease. Yes. I do have these aches and, and pains and I do have these issues in my life. But Alhamdulillah, I can still go through with, with my day and with life. All right, you talked about biopuncture. What is biopuncture and when would you use it on a patient? Okay, so uh, biopuncture is using sterile diluted. It's diluted doses of homeopathic and um, herbal preparations. And when I say diluted, I emphasize on that because the toxicity in, the, uh, in any of the products, it's usually plant-based, so plant or mineral-based that are used for anti-inflammatory pro properties as well as self-healing mechanisms. And uh, so that there is no toxic effect in it. So if I inject you with biopuncture, the stimulus, which is the, the needle, when it is inserted into the skin, whether it's subcutaneous, intramuscular, or whether it's just, uh, whether it's superficial, that stimulus already, the body recognizes it as something entering, something foreign. And what happens is all your red blood cells, all your defense me mechanisms come into action. And that in itself is such a wonderful process because that already promotes self-healing. And the way that Allah created us is so beautiful that He created us with this immune system. And he created us with such a beautiful way that we are able to self-heal. And through whatever types of treatments and medications that you do have, it all comes from Allah and it's the shifa through that, through, or through, or through that which Allah grants to you. These things just help your body to get to its natural form and its natural state of health. So it just enhances it and takes it up a notch. Let's talk about people suffering from diabetes. Yes. If they are still taking their conventional meds, can they come to you to support what they're on? Will there be no interaction? And would your therapy help them heal? Can they ever overcome the condition and become well again? Or will they be living with that as a chronic illness for the rest of their lives? Most certainly they can, can come, especially if they are taking conventional medication. Homeopathy can assist further. Um, there are a lot of homeopathic, herbal, as well as functional medicines which work amazingly in diabetes type 1 and type 2. So for instance, uh, like just for instance your herb, Gemnema, you can use a herb like that which will help to cut down that sugar. It, it works as a stabilizer. So the lovely thing about homeopathy is that it modulates your body. So it doesn't drop your sugar that low where now you're going to go into a hypo hypoglycemic attack or it doesn't re, uh, you know increase it it just modulates it to to remain in the, within the normal range so you can use it yes and there are a lot of times where um, a patient of mine would come to me with diabetes cholesterol high blood pressure these main types of and, and especially in our Indian community, the and I don't like to generalize it, because of our lifestyle, because of our diet and nutrition, these are common things that we do suffer from, especially with the weight gain, with the type of foods that we eat, with the stress of our daily lives. Okay, you've touched on something that every woman wants to yes. know about. How do we tackle weight gain? Can someone come to you, someone who's maybe obese or just have, has a couple of extra excess kilos that they're wanting to get rid of? How yes. do you help them with that? <laughs> so definitely uh, weight, weight loss is one of the big things with homeopathic uh, treatment. Uh, it's the natural way. So you don't want to shock your body and put anything that's going to suppress your appetite. You want to still have and maintain a good appetite. However, you want to use your herbs like your chromium, um, just sugar balance control. So it's, it's good to monitor your sugar levels. Obviously, you would do thyroid tests to see if there's anything uh, like diagnostically, you know, uh, over affecting active or overactive or underactive. Mm -hmm. So you would rule out all these conditions. Right. And depending on that, if there are no underlying conditions as well, and it's just a, a metabolic syndrome, um, there are a lot of injections, so like your lipolytic injections. You would use that, those ampules, and you would inject it like you would biopuncture. So who does that? Do you I do? I do it, yes. And do you have to be on those injections for how long? So you would be on that injection till 
you would your desired. So if you want to your carry desired on, weight. your desired weight. So there is no limitations to it. You can use it till you get to, if your desired weight is 60 kilos and you need so much of fat reduced from your certain areas in your body, that's what we will tackle. So, so you, you target use, a certain area. You target area. certain areas at the time, depending on the patient, what is the most concerning uh, areas and what is the most, most concerning factors. And you would do it in that way, along with your remedies and your, your uh, nutritional advice. Obviously, you have to go on a you, proper, uh, a to. sensible eating plan yes. in conjunction with your support. Yes, and I don't like the word diet because I feel diet <laughs> restricts you so you feel that you can't eat a lot of mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be that way. It just should be opting for the healthier option. So you still should have your meals throughout the day. It's just that you need to eat foods that promote weight loss as well as it's a healthy for you, so you need a bit of your protein, a bit of carbs, a bit of fiber. You need a, a balanced diet. Everything in life is about a balance, and I think with that as well. Let's look at smokers. People are wanting to quit smoking. Someone's smoking um, a pack of 30 per day, or maybe even yes. two packs for that matter, and has a persistent cough. How are you going to treat that person? So the homeopathic remedies are the best for that and there are anti-smoking homeopathic remedies alhamdulillah i, I must work? say i've had a lot of success and i'll tell you a funny story uh my husband was a smoker oh wow okay <laughs> so and it's just something i the more that i would tell him not to smoke i think the more that he would he would like want to smoke and I think the one day I said you know what I'm just going to hear the sciatica back pain so I was treating him for that and I took home a little bit of anti-smoking uh, pellules for him and I just wrote I, I wrote smoking and I took off the remedy and I said let me just write the sciatica treatment mm. and it was a little bit of a, a tricky thing but I said let me just give it to him because it's mind of a matter as well sure. So Alhamdulillah, he took the granules every day and it was just before last year Ramadan and I remember him telling me that, you know what, I'm just not craving these cigarettes and the more, whenever I'm smoking, it's just not, it's making me feel a little ill. And he cut down and cut down and eventually he said, I can't do it anymore. And he just, he just stopped. Oh, wow, Alhamdulillah. And from that, that he just, and did you eventually was, tell him that you tricked him? Eventually I did him. tell him. Yes, I did tell him that I tricked uh -huh. him. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I e ended up telling everyone what happened. It was just a little experiment of my own. And it's that worked. I had done it's and it was it was it worked. Okay, well, it's wrap up time, believe it or yes. not. What do you want to leave our viewers with as far as overall health and well being is concerned? Or even someone like I've touched on the smoking, someone yes. who's got this chronic cough all the time, thinking that eventually I'm going to have to walk around with an oxygen mask. Yes. What can you help them definitely and I think the most important thing is that you know your body and I think we know our body so well that when something happens to us it is so important for us it's our bodies and a man that Allah has given to us mm -hmm. and I think it's so important that we tackle it at that moment so the, the quicker that you do uh, treat any condition whether it's the slightest thing instead of leaving it to persist over a long time it can be treated definitely and homeopathy, functional medicine, biomedicine, it's a wonderful way of treating something, especially if you want a cure, if you want a long-term treatment. All right, very quickly, what's the difference between functional medicine and biomedicine? So functional medicine is just correcting any deficiencies in your body through alternative health care. So if there is any imbalances, especially like hormonal, um, with, uh, with regards to vitamin D deficiencies, any type of problems in the body, it means that you are also treating the patient as a whole. So you want to correct every level of uh, imbalance in their body just to sustain it to a better, uh, a That's healthier functional. state. That's yes. functional. And what's bio? So uh, with the biopuncture, biomedicine. Biomedicine. Biomedicine is just, uh, well, it's, the approach is just more symptom-based. Okay. So biomedicine, in, if you have an, a, a condition, it's usually treated according to the symptoms and uh -huh. not the underlying okay, cause. Fine. All right. So there's more, there's a, 
a great effect with homeopathy with functional are medicine. you would you advocate um, mineral and vitamin supplements people you know lots of people take yes. supplements over-the-counter supplements are you uh, for that or against it i am for it but i would love to first find out what the deficiency is ah. i don't like to give anything that the body doesn't need so with proper blood tests with proper uh, ph testing etc i would give it according to what the body needs and that's where we have to leave it lovely talking to you and thank you so much Jazakallah for coming in khair. my pleasure that was Dr. Raissa Desa. She's a home, uh, homeopath based in Oakland, Johannesburg, talking to us about homeopathy. Hope you've enjoyed that. Still to come on the show, Lynn Zurnamba to talk to us about endometriosis. Stay with us. We have to take an ad break first. And time really does fly by when you're having uh, lots of fun and you know, have interesting guests to talk about the most amazing things. Um, and that's exactly what happened with our first uh, two guests this morning. And I have no doubt that it's going to be the same with our guest, uh, the next guest, Lynn Zunama. She's um, from Oz Communication. She's tell, uh, tell us all about that. But this time around, we're going to talk endometriosis. Now, I know we have talked about this previously with a medical practitioner, but we're going to take a slightly different stance with Lynn on the subject this morning. And please do feel free to call in. The lines are open. Lynn, good morning. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Junie. Thanks lovely, for having me. Lovely to see you after such a long time. I do hope I'm pronouncing your surname correctly. It is correct. Your number. number, yes. Okay. No. You are with Oz Health? Oz Healthcare Communications. So Healthcare, Healthcare Communications. Healthcare Communications. So we're a company that specializes in healthcare and one of our areas that we work in is educating the consumer and providing information to the consumer about different healthcare and disease issues. Okay, so who are these consumers that you target? Is it the general public? The general public, yeah. And how do you disseminate, uh, disseminate information to them? Various ways. Um, a lot of the times via the media, where we have media workshops and we have doctors and specialists coming in and chatting to the media about different conditions. Um, also pamphlets and leaflets that we make um, for companies and we distribute or the companies distribute it for them and then also via health days and wellness days where we go to companies to talk about different um, con conditions or having a wellness day where we measure blood pressure um, and look at different measurements and helping patients to understand and interpret the, the different medical lingo and you know the information that goes with it. All right, and then help them manage the, the, their conditions and their lives, so yes, to well, speak. Well, ultimately, you know, mm. if people understand what's going on with them, then they can make a decision in terms of do they want to go the conventional route to a doctor? Do they want to go the homeopathic route, as you've just discussed yes. with your other guests? Do they want to <laughs> and take you're all medication? For it? You know what? I don't know enough about homeopathy to okay. say that I'm all for it or not, but, but it, it sounded very interesting. Okay, great. You come from a medical background yourself. Tell us a little about the shift that you made as a nursing sister and then moved on to open up Oz um, Healthcare Communications. Well, I studied nursing and then came to Johannesburg to seek my fortune, <laughs> landed up in the pharmaceutical industry, okay. and then eventually started Oz Healthcare Communications, where the pharmaceutical industry are some of my clients. So I have different, um, seg you know, uh, uh, sectors that are my clients and the pharmaceutical industry is one of them. But I also work with the media, I work with the banks, um, with different companies and mm -hmm. then different stakeholders. different stakeholders. And then obviously our, our focus really is on health education. Right now, and that's exactly what we're going to do with what we're putting on the table this morning, that is endometriosis. Why are you so interested in this specific condition? Well, I have endometriosis myself, Ooh. and that led me to, to um, start the New Endometriosis Society of South Africa about five years ago, because when I started researching endometriosis and realizing the problems that I had, which we will probably be talking about as we go along, really was not normal, and that it, I should not consider the pain that I lived in as normal, and I should really not put up with it. I realized that I really wasn't the only one out there. And we now know that one in 10 women of reproductive age actually has endometriosis and it's a suffering, it's a painful, chronic, long-term condition that very often is overlooked because the symptoms are very interlinked with womanly problems. So we have very severe period pains, 
very heavy menstrual bleeding and other conditions that we are often shy about to talk about or often we just feel that it's part and parcel of being a woman and, and you're afraid people are going to say to you get over it well, oh for goodness sake get over it well you know we raised that way as young girls <laughs> you're strong you're a woman yes. get over it it's part of being a woman and often you know when you go to doctors and you're trying to describe what your pain is all about and you're telling them that you've got constant pain I think they get a little bit tired of you and they think it's all in your head mm, and mm. so ultimately you you're left out in the cold and what the endometriosis society aims to do is to educate consumers and doctors about the latest information about about endometriosis and raise awareness so that this condition can be diagnosed early and can be treated properly because there is help out there. All right, so now you've you established the foundation or the society about five years ago. What have you done differently and how are you empowering women with this condition to better their lives, to, to get over um, you know, this, this, this chronic pain that they find themselves in. What is it that you're saying to them? And I should imagine somewhere along uh, in this group is a support group as well. We have a fantastic um, group of women, the Indo Warriors of South ah. Africa, run by a lady called Rochelle Heltzinger, and they do superb work. Um, they are on Facebook, and I'm sure later on we can give, give out the address. And what the difference is here really is that these the, with, with the Indo Warriors, it facilitated us raising a really nice platform for people to join. So they have an open group where people can discuss um, the, you know, their condition and their symptoms, but they also have a closed group where it's more private and you can talk more intimately about your problems. The, the issue with endometriosis, as with many other chronic diseases, is what do you know about the condition and how freely can you talk about it and how can you access specialists or doctors that do know what this condition is all about so that you are diagnosed early and you are put on the correct treatment or the appropriate treatment early on and not left for many many years without treatment to suffer in silence mm -hmm. so what exactly is endometriosis and how did you realize when and how did you realize that this is what you've got and you need to do something about it well, endometriosis is when the endometrial tissue that is normally inside your womb grows outside your Ooh. womb. And the, the problem that we have is that under normal circumstances, if I can call it that, when it's inside your womb, your endometrial, endometrial tissue is controlled or influenced by your hormones, by your estrogen and progesterone. So every single month, that endometrium swells up and becomes thicker in preparation for a fertilized egg um, so that it, to become pregnant. If you don't become pregnant, then that endometrial lining bleeds off. That's what's your period. Ah. Now imagine when this similar tissue to the endometrial, to the endometrium grows outside your uterus. So it might grow on the outside of the uterus. It often grows in the pelvic or mostly in the pelvic area, but it can also grow elsewhere. So it grows on the outside of your uterus. It can grow on your fallopian tubes, on your ovaries, on your bladder, everywhere. As it, as the, the tissue inside your uterus now swells up in preparation for a pregnancy, so this tissue that's outside the uterus also swells up. And of course when it bleeds off, there's very little space for all the bleeding to go. There's little space for the endometrial tissue that's outside the uterus the, the, to, to grow. And so that causes adhesions and other problems. Um, and it's often the pain that's associated with that causes inflammation and pain, chronic pain, that will make people go to the doctor or make them suffer in silence. It's, it sounds like a very unnatural process going, going on inside of your womb and outside of your womb. What are the risks of cancer with these patients? There's no real link that we know of at this stage. Obviously that's stuff that, you know, that's information that, that through the scientific committee they look at. But as far as I know, there's no conclusive link between endometriosis and cancer. Is it true that people that suffer suffers from this condition, 90% uh, or possibly even more, uh, will not be able to have children, cannot fall pregnant? There is definitely a link between endometriosis and infertility, but not as high as 90%. It's somewhere in the region of between 30 and 50% of women with endometriosis will 
battle to fall pregnant. But again, if you are if you are diagnosed early and you are accessing treatment early, then the damage to your fallopian tubes or the blockages that the endometrium endometriosis may cause can be limited or can be treated and or can the growth and the proliferation thereof can be stopped. So there is a link, but there are many, many women out there that once they've had the you know, once they've accessed proper treatment and often often after long, long, many, many years of treatment, they do fall pregnant. But there is a link. Okay. And in fact, Julie, often endometriosis can also be silent. There can also be no symptoms Ooh. other than you, f you battle to fall pregnant. And so mm -hmm. very frequently it is picked up when you go for fertility treatment. Then the doctors make a diagnosis and see that you actually do have endometriosis. That is why there's a misperception that all women with endometriosis can't have children. And that part is not true. And of course the other misconception then would be that women that suffer from this condition are, suffer from excruciating pain. Well, many, many do. The, that's the misnomer, is that many women, endometriosis is generally a painful and very debilitating long-term chronic condition. But on the flip side, there are women that have endometriosis and they don't have any pain. Okay, let's take an ad break. Lynn Zurnamer from Oz Healthcare Communications is our guest this morning talking about endometriosis. If you have any questions or comments, do call in. The lines are open. And she, of course, um, started out this uh, society uh, about five years ago because she, too, is a sufferer of the condition. So who better to talk to us about endometriosis than Lynn Zurnamer? Let's take an ad break. <music> We're talking to Lynn Zurnamba from Oz Healthcare uh, uh, Communications. We're talking endometriosis. And if you would like to have any questions or comments that you want to share with us, please call in on the open lines. Now, we've talked a lot about the condition, Lynn. Um, let's talk about treatment and treatment options. What's, you know, kind of the best that's available out there? Because people often wonder and worry about side effects as well. Well, there's a few issues within that. Number one is that endometriosis is a long, chronic, it's a chronic disease. So you're going to be on, on treatment for the rest of your life. You, but the treatment's going to bring you a lot of relief. So yes, you probably will have to be on long-term treatment, and there are different treatment options, sometimes intermittent treatment. But the, the best treatment is a progesterone pill that has been researched specifically for endometriosis. It's one of the best. I and mean, you can never say one treatment is better than the other. And the side effects, the moment you say progesterone, you know, you worry about um, cancers, etc. No, you know what? I think that's more on the estrogen side oh, that people the estrogen worry side. about cancers, okay. which is also, um, you know, which is also not really understood. And it's it's often the the risk for cancer is often overemphasized. There, you know, when you when you look in context to, um, and that's another discussion we can have about breast cancer and estrogen, etc. Sure. But progesterone isn't um, linked to cancer, and especially the kind of dosages that you are getting in the medications that are prescribed. And one must remember that these medications, if we're talking about pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals have been researched for many, many, many years and go through a vigorous testing and registration period before they are put on the market. And the post-marketing surveillance afterwards is also very, very rigorous. So the, the risk of unknown side effects or unexpected side effects creeping in is limited that way. Because so what are the side effects? Well, it depends on which medications you're on. So with let me first tell you what, what, you know, if you're asking me what the side effects are of progesterone, I think it affects people differently. There are, you know, headaches, there are probably mood changes, but not everyone gets it. If you look at a progesterone pill and endometriosis, for instance, the, 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 the specific pill that's been developed for endometriosis stops or limits the growth of that endometrial tissue because it decreases your estrogen just enough so that the tissue doesn't grow as vigorously and not as low as to push you into menopause. And that's why, and it's been tested for long-term treatment. So the long-term side effects are not, you know, are not that dangerous in the long, in, in terms of the effect that you're going Absolutely to get. Absolutely so. Because with medicine, you always have to weigh up right. the effect versus side effect. There mm -hmm. is no medication 
re there is no medication that doesn't have side effects. Medications always have side effects and they have e effects. And as you've been telling me from other people that I've heard uh, about this excruciating pain, I think it's worth going the, uh, the, the, the treatment route because obviously you don't want to be suffering for the rest of your life. There are also people, and we can come back to other side effects, but there are also women who've opted to have uh, hysterectomies thinking that they're going to be pain-free for the rest of their lives. Is that a treatment option and would you advocate it? I wouldn't advocate, or the science doesn't advocate, hysterectomies as a first line or early on treatment. Sadly, many women with hysterectomy, uh, with endometriosis, end up having a hysterectomy before exploring or trying out other treatments prior to going the hysterectomy route. Regrettably, a hysterectomy does not take your endometriosis away. Remember, endometriosis is outside the uterus. Oh. It's not in the uterus. And even if you take the ovaries out, because we do know that, it, that endometriosis grows under the influence of estrogen, your ovaries aren't the only um, organs making estrogen. Your body still makes estrogen. So a hysterectomy very often is disappointing for women because it doesn't take all the symptoms away as completely as they would have hoped. Whereas the medication, on the medication side, the, it, the, they very, very often, many of the women who are put on medication don't have to go the hysterectomy route because their symptoms are controlled. Again, not everyone is the same and not everyone is successful with the medication. So it's not medication. one size fits all, You obviously. have to give it a trial, though. You know mm -hmm. what? Before you do something as drastic as a hysterectomy, give it a trial. Speak to your doctor about an endometriosis treatment that is specifically there for endometriosis for the long term and give it a try. It, can't, it really can't do you any harm, especially under the supervision of a doctor. And there may be situations with certain women that would have to try it three, four different treatments to find something that's going to fit them exactly or suit them best with minimal side effects? Well, it's difficult to say minimal side effects because everyone, many women, women experience side effects differently. So we are all different. I may go on a medication and get such severe headaches that I can't cope with the medication. Someone else may go on the very same med medication and they, they might get headaches but not as severe as mine. They might have other side effects. Maybe they have spotting or nausea or they feel they're putting on weight. People are different in how they experience side effects and what they will tolerate. If we come back to the treatment or treatment options available for endometriosis, it's important to remember that there are different treatments that can help you manage your symptoms better. There's one in South Africa, there's one long-term treatment registered for endometriosis and that is the progestin pill. There is, however, an intrauterine system, you know, device that is really used for birth control, but it also has a registration for managing heavy menstrual bleeding and as part of your treatment for for pre, for pre when you go into menopause. And very often when you put the IUS in, the intrauterine system, it stops your periods completely or makes them very, very light. And so that your period pain and the very severe bleeding is very often treated that way. But it doesn't, there's no data there that shows that the intrauterine system treats the endometriosis per se. You also have um, what we call GnRH drugs, which are very often used for cancer, but they are also used in the short term for endometriosis because they put women into menopause and in that way will completely cut off your estrogen and stop the growth of the endometriosis for the period of time that you're on the medication. But because it's quite a severe treatment, it is not a long-term treatment. You can use it, I think the one is registered for three months and the other one registered for six months. Um, so you can use that. You can also use combined oral contraceptives, although it's not registered for the use of, uh, for treating endometriosis. Many of the, the guidelines, the treatment guidelines for endometriosis, do recommend that you use combined oral contraceptives. But those guidelines were written before the, the progesterone drug was developed for endometriosis. So I guess there is, um, you know, there's different options that you can speak to your doctor about. The, the important thing is that endometriosis cannot be ruled out in the absence of a laparoscopy. So a laparoscopy is a surgery, it's keyhole surgery, but it's by no means a small surgery, mm -hmm. <laughs> where doctors can actually take a look at is there endometriosis, where is it situated, how severe is it, and at the same time they can excise it, cut it out or burn it out. That is, the is, that, is that sort of the last option a treatment and would that then free you of endometriosis for life? No, it's very often a first option. 
Oh. It's, it's, a very, it's a very good treatment. It's very, very, very often a first option to go and take a look and see what's going on because once a doctor that is skilled at doing laparoscopies, because that's the other thing we must rem remember, that it's important to be with a doctor that has done many laparoscopies in his or her life and that knows what they're looking for and that knows where to go and look for the endometriosis and knows what the endometriosis looks like. It's um, not a small surgery in that you, you are, even though the, the cuts are very small and the recovery process is, you know, a little bit quicker than before and because it is a keyhole surgery, more people can have it, it is very important that you are with someone that is very skilled at doing your, your laparoscopy. So do your research before you uh, undergo surgery. Yes. You can approach us. We, we, You'd be we able can to give refer. you doctors in your area mm -hmm. that are endometriosis doctors and doctors that are skilled surgeons. Mm -hmm. And then you asked whether it will cure the endometriosis. No. It will come back again. After Unless, how long? And I know again, usually it's a very general two, question. Usually the data shows that after about two years, mm -hmm. it does recur again. But there is ongoing work having a look at if you're doing lap laparoscopies and afterwards you put patients onto the progesterone therapy so that it limits the growth of the, or the regrowth of the endometriosis. As long as you have estrogen, you are at risk of your endometriosis growing. Okay. Um, obviously, this then suggests that postmenopausal women, um, if you've suffered with the condition all your life, once you hit your menopausal years, you're going to be free of this curse. Yes. <laughs> yes. So there's benefits for us, you know, embracing our menopause. It's not the end of the world for women to go into menopause. It's a new phase of our life and very often something like endometriosis and, you know, the discomfort of having periods is gone which means that could also be used as a therapy. A younger woman who's already had her babies and is suffering terribly with endometriosis, could that be an option for her to bring on early menopause? No, because menopause in itself has side effects. <laughs> okay, You need your estrogen for good strong bones, for instance. So menopause risks osteoporosis and once you cut off a woman's estrogen, they are more at risk for heart attack and strokes than what men are. True. So it's putting women into early menopause is really not an option. That's exactly what the GnRH drugs do, which I told you about earlier yes. that we spoke about, which you use for short periods mm -hmm. of time, because you certainly don't want to be putting people into menopause when they're young. You, you definitely don't want to. If a girl has a family history, her mom has suffered from it, or a granny or sister, whatever have you, she is afraid that she might be at risk. Is there anything at all that she can in her pre-teen years start doing to prevent becoming a statistic of endometriosis? No. It, you are correct that, that she's more at risk. Okay? A woman with, with, with a mother or a grandmother with endometriosis is five to seven times more at risk of developing it yourself. The, herself, there definitely is a, a, a link there. Mm -hmm. And the, there is nothing that you can do to stop it. But what you can do is be alerted to it. And don't tolerate the same kind of suffering that your mother and your grandmother did because in those days there was very little information about it and certainly no treatments around to treat endometriosis. So as a mother, if you know this is what your suffering was, you certainly wouldn't want to inflict it on your daughter. So keep an eye out, alert your daughter and you know what, take her to a gynecologist if, her, if, if she starts going, starts having her menses and she realizes that she's having pain or she's being nauseous, or she's vomiting during a period, then take her to the doctor and have it diagnosed. Finally, are there any other conditions linked to endometriosis? And the, what would they be? And what can you do to prevent coming down with those conditions in a conjunction with the endometriosis? You know, Julie, I wish that we knew, because if we did know, <laughs> then we would, be able to, we would be able to really stop everyone suffering from this condition. Right. There is a link to, you know, autoimmune diseases, exactly what they are, I would, I wouldn't want to elaborate because I know too little about it, but there is a link, but there's really nothing at this stage that we know that we can do to prevent endometriosis. There's nothing we can do. Okay, so you've given us a lot of information today and lots of hope, I should imagine, to people suffering from the condition. Please give us uh, details or give us your website address for the support groups so that at least they know that there's someone in at the end of the line that understands what they're talking about when they talk about the excruciating pain. I'm going to give you the website first and then I'm going to give you the, the Facebook address for the Indo Warriors sure. because I think it's very important that women link up through the Indo Warriors. So the website address is very easy. We want to end the pain, so it's called www.endpain.com. 
www.indowarriors.co.za wow. and then to find the Indo Warriors you go to Facebook and you type in Indo Warriors South Africa. Lynn it's been wonderful talking to you and I must say you look a picture of absolute glowing health. I do hope that you're over or you are managing your endometriosis. I am managing my endometriosis is very well managed. Wonderful because you look great. Thank, Thank you for you. being with us in the studio this morning. We do hope we'll be talking to you again. I'm sure we're going to have lots and lots of discussions going forward. Thanks for your time. That was Lynn Zurnamer from Oz Healthcare Communications talking to us about endometriosis. And that, of course, brings us to the end of the show. Thank you indeed for your company. And I'm going to end off this morning not with a quote, but with a dua. I hope and pray, inshallah, it is the final days of the month of Ramadan. We've all been searching for the night of Qadr. Tonight might be the night, and if it is, uh, my dua for each and every one of you is that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his choices of blessings upon you and may you be blessed with a night of power, Laylatul Qadr. On that note, it is Assalamu alaikum and khudafiz from me, Julie Ali. <laughs>